uh, we are being uh, overwhelmed with uh, data, uh, and we now have an opportunity to discuss it uh, amongst ourselves and to analyze it and ask uh, the lecturers. So I'd like to invite Eyal and Eran to return to the stage. And uh, we will take questions from the audience. Rakefet. Rakefet. Yeah. Well, as far as I know, there is a lag in this uh, context in Israel. That is, the prevalent measures are on labor income inequality. They, let's say this, the Central Bureau of Statistics has an income survey, which is a sub-survey of the labor force survey. That survey gets to labor income, a bit to capital income. I'm not sure the coverage of capital income is that good. And I'm not aware of a Central Bureau of Statistics survey of assets or capital assets. You could deduce some things from the income survey, but because, as I said, it's very partial on capital income, it would be not be that good. So the bottom line is, the Central Bureau of Statistics does not provide us with good information on asset distribution and therefore asset poverty. We can try to deduce it from other data sets, but I'm not aware of serious work that's been done on it uh, anywhere within the academic community or within the Bank of Israel. That is, the data situation is not good on that front, as far as I know. Maybe one of my colleagues know, knows better than I do. Actually, I want to use your uh, question to, to respond to something that Yossi has uh, shown. Um, he showed that the fraction of owner, uh, those who own their own housing is, is, uh, is lower in 2008 than in 1995. Now, we also know from, we just uh, had the, the release of the Bank of Israel report a few weeks ago that uh, put some light on, on the prices that have changed, and especially the price of housing that has increased. And, and if you think about those young people, the young middle class people who just finished their education, and they really started in late, and that's maybe why they, 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 fewer of them own their own housing. But it's right now when they have to buy their housing. And right now the price of housing is really, really high. So it doesn't really matter that they make uh, per perhaps even more than their previous generation was making, but the previous generation has to spend much less on housing and, and it, to that extent on, on, on other uh, assets than, than the current generation. Uh, so perhaps this is the reason for the protest, is the timing, is that these people are now have to buy their housing, now it's very expensive. The same perhaps is true for daycare. The daycare prices has been, has been, have been increasing. These are the people, uh, middle class, young middle class, who are now want to find good jobs and have to find daycare for their kids. Now it's very expensive, now they're complaining, now they're protesting. I defer to my economist friends on this point. Professor Rabanovich.
I think uh, people have spoken about this, and there's been uh, this very important government committee of, uh, that look at market concentration uh, that actually this committee started working even before the protest. It only, uh, the protest just was used to, to speed up the, the process. But it's quite clear that we have a price uh, problem in Israel, and it's quite, quite clear that the monopolization of markets is, is, a, is a key issue, and perhaps some other structural issues like bureaucracy and, and other things that are more important in, in, uh, in for example, in the housing market. Um, it's difficult to change these things. You can't, you can't do it from today to tomorrow. And, uh, but and it's and some of these things are very difficult to to change. You have to deal with uh, with the big uh, with very big employers and and uh, people who have influence on politicians and labor unions and and the like. Uh, I think the government is aware that things have to be changed. Uh, perhaps they're not doing this uh, fast enough, but uh, but I think the message is is there. I mean, we know that we pay too much for many items now. Now we know since the protest. We are aware, aware of that. We, we pay too much for, for many daily items, and, uh, and there's something that needs to be done about that. Uh, my own, I, I'll add just a bit. My answer is in the same direction, but let me give you a, a striking example that we heard just last week in Taub that Eitan Shashinsky told us about. The, the, the water mineral, mineral water sources in Israel, which should have belonged to the state of Israel, it's natural resources of Israel. They have been given free of charge, just for free, to three companies, uh, three commercial companies to produce mineral water. These companies charge on the margin a price which is times 375, 375 times the production cost. So this is a very extreme example but of a very high price charged by an oligopolistic market that was set up basically by the Israeli government. Why, did the Israeli, why does the Israeli government, not in the past, in the present, give license to three privately owned companies to produce pro mineral water at such exorbitant prices? Uh, it's a good question to ask the government. My sense is that there are strong lobbies of, of what we call tycoons now in Israel, of various business people, that because of the weak political structure that I alluded to earlier in my talk, the weak political structure gives in to the pressures exerted by these oligopolistic and monopolistic companies. Well, I, Itamar, part of it has to do with the privileged status of capital in Israel throughout our history, ever since going back to Sapir. There is always this belief that capital is more migrant than labor, that it should be enticed to remain. Therefore, profits should be higher than they are elsewhere. And I think part of what we see has to do with that. It's an inherent problem in the Israeli economy. It's, present, it's assumed to be unsafe, volatile, and that's part of the reason that uh, these conglomerates have such a privileged status. They have had it for forever. I I'd like to go back to education and ask you to elaborate, Ayala, a little bit more on the kinds of human capital and post secondary education that aren't so easily captured by either a BA or an MA, but other kinds of skill building and job training. Of what is the approach? Well, we can talk about this forever. Um, <laughs> we know um, that what you might call vocational or vocationally specific training, which is, I think, what you're referring to, um, is, is, uh, is highly diverse in its effectiveness. In some places, you know, take the example of Germany, um, 
there, are, there, are, there is an abundance of apprenticeship programs and various, various systems which are highly geared to immediate labor force placement. And in other places, um, uh, uh, vocational education has been extremely ineffective. It's been uh, education for the poor, a neglected form of education, a stigmatizing form of education. Now in Israel we've had experiences with both. At the secondary level it was mostly uh, the latter. And in the tertiary level there isn't uh, enough of it. Uh, as I'm sure you know. Um, so um, this has been a serious issue. There is a strong lobby which is trying to push for effective vocational education headed by uh, um, hmm? Steph Wertheimer. Uh, it, it's an issue. I can't say that I know that much is being done, but it's definitely wanting. I want to run into to another part of your question. Um, we think about education as a type of human capital, and human capital we normally divide into two kinds, uh, general human capital and specific human capital. Now, specific human capital means that you learn to, 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 to make some kind of contribution to your employer, and that's about it. And general human capital means that you can use your education almost anywhere. Now, uh, I think in Israel, the education system is more specific than the US. If you think about college education, you start you start college and you, you immediately have to choose a major and that takes you in that direction uh, unless you change. Uh, I think the global uh, labor market now requires more general human capital. And we need people who have these skills that are not necessarily useful in, the next, uh, by, by your next, in your next uh, job, but the skills that will enable you to, to stay on the job and develop in the job and move to another job because you know, people now uh, uh, change jobs uh, much more frequently than they did in the past. So perhaps this general human capital is becoming more important. Now, the, 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 the other side of the story is that when you educate people with more general human capital, then that human capital is now demanded anywhere. So people, as you said, are educated in Israel. The government invests in public education. These people now take their human capital and go elsewhere. I don't think we can do much about that. But uh, so, so this is the risk that we have to take when we compete in the global economy. Please. Uh, I, have, I have a thought. That the reason that Seth Rebheim was involved with this has to do with school business partnerships. In the United States, you know, that's what we call it. We talk about having real life learning. So we have students working in, you know, in applied learning with business corporations while in education. So they understand why they are learning, what they are learning, and both both groups benefit from that. Wertheimer did that with his talk. He took his community and had them work uh, and produce products, produce, you know, provide real, build the human capital by building the economic capital. The problem is they should not be either or. They should be both. They should be working together in real life learning, applied learning. That's what I think is not happening. This is how, this is what's happening here in the States. I only see some of this going on in Israel. No. Where do you see it in the States? This school business partnerships, all over the United States we have them. We have programs like that throughout the, in all kinds of programs. We've got a thing, a, a, a little thing like virtual enterprise, international, in which in the schools, in the high school, it's like a virtual enterprise. They think that they're creating a business. You have a whole community of students working in the schools. It is now, in fact, it came, it started, I don't want to go into this, started in Austria, but it is now throughout the United States, and we have it in now nine other countries. That's a very little piece. You had the, you had the uh, Academy Foundation that started with uh, Sandy Wild for many years that built academies of finance, academies of travel and tourism. And what we found
We, we will have more discussion on education policy uh, in the afternoon session. So there'll be an opportunity to raise these issues again. Uh, there was a question over here. Anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah. Actually, I think Michael should come up and, and tackle that one. Why don't you? Well, he's, he's going to give a paper in the afternoon, perhaps. Yeah. If you'd, can but, we re return to this question uh, in the afternoon? But, but I can say something about Please. this based on a conversation. I spoke with some of the protest leaders, and they had also some public um, pronouncements. Some of them willingly, sort of, sort of knowingly, consciously, want to avoid becoming political parties or political leaders. But there are some who do speak about engaging in the political process. For example, Itzik Shmuli, who was one of the protest leaders and he's the head of the student union, has been going around the Knesset for months now. I met him there, speaking with politicians about their ideas and their demands. And he's not establishing a party yet, but he's speaking with politicians political figures, speaking with lawmakers and trying to take part in the political process in the Knesset of uh, instituting change. He hasn't been successful so far, but he certainly had this in mind. The, the, a troubling aspect, perhaps, is that the, on this dimension, the demonstration movement, the protest movement, has been suffering sort of a division. They have already divided up into several factions, and some other faction leaders are saying we, we would do not want to take part in the political process. I would say that like any other political, any other organization in the world, including the Taub Center, people need finance, people need backing, and I'm sure they would welcome it. I mean, I'm not speaking on their behalf, but I think there is a role, yes? And, I, and as far as I know, there are actually some protest leaders right now in both London and in the US looking for such support. American Jewish philanthropy is already heavily involved in the Israeli political uh, process, normally on the right wing of the spectrum. But there's already an involvement and a commitment there. If it'll reappear elsewhere, it'll have interesting results. Henriette.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll try to remember all, all your questions. First of all, about the military, I think the facts you said are exactly right, that they are disadvantaged by not having the kind of human capital so in economic language that a person gets through the army service. And yes, they are certainly the ultra-Orthodox and the Arabs are disadvantaged because of that. Although there is an exception, Druze men and Bedouin men, some of them at least, do serve in the army. But later on, when you see their outcomes in the labor market and in the economy in general, they don't seem that fantastic. That is, when I looked specifically into that, they go back from the army and they are as disadvantaged as their mates. So this is the warning signal. Uh, but there are serious people who say that both ultra-Orthodox men and Arab men, Muslim Arab men, should serve in the Israeli army and that it was a historical mistake by Israeli governments not to have them serve. Obviously, it's a very sensitive political question for each population, but I think the general thrust of what you said is correct. Let me add just one more point. The, the burden, the tax burden on Israelis is on the working Israelis, and the military burden, military service burden, is on the very same people. So there is also a lack of symmetry in the burden shared in, in the sense of the military not only offering privileges or communication networks, but also in terms of the tax that you have to pay. The same people pay taxes on work and pay taxes in the, in the form of three-year or two-year service. The, the point about the Wisconsin program or the so-called, generally it's called welfare to work programs, it was implemented in Israel, it was implemented in various stages. The latest stage was four areas of Israel being a pilot study of a Wisconsin-style program. It worked for a year and something, and it was that, st that particular phase of the program, and it was stopped by the Knesset. The Knesset, for various political reasons, did terminated the program. And ever since, for about two, almost two years now, the Treasury Ministry has been negotiating with the Knesset the terms whereby they could restart the program. What I think was inaccurate is that it was not perceived as a failure. There was at least one study, uh, sort of half academic study, that showed some successes for this program but it was too limited and too short-lived to be fairly judged. My, my hope, let's say, is that it will be reinstated with, with reform, perhaps sort of with corrections, and that it will be given another chance. Because, by the way, the most successful group coming out of that program were young Arab men. They were placed in employment and they did achieve some success. The last point about you said Palestinian, but you, I thought you meant Arab-Israeli or Israeli-Palestinians, Israeli let's call them that way. I've been personally researching the Arabs in Israel for over four years now in a joint project with the Bank of Israel. And one interesting thing that we found is the following. Though the gap between Arab women and Jewish women in terms of education has narrowed down, the employment gap between them has increased. So education is not the whole story. It's an important part of the story, like elsewhere in the world, but it's not the whole story. And our research shows that it would be insufficient just to get Arab women educated. You need other things, more things. Can I just ask a follow-up on the question of the impact of the military? What is the impact of the large foreign labor sector mm. in, on wage inequalities and maintaining mm. low yeah. wages? There, there is an important, it's an important factor, and I think it's consistent with what Ayal has shown, that the presence of foreign migrant workers coming from Thailand, from China, from, El from Africa and elsewhere has been to depress Israeli employment and wages. 
And mostly it affects the disadvantaged groups, for example, the Arabs. So there is like a competition between weak populations in the labor market and the migrant worker population is hurting the weak populations of the Israeli market. Okay. Gentleman in the back. I'm wondering the statistics presented earlier this morning uh, are similar in the Jewish population in the West Bank. Is there such a subcategory or they are just following the general presentation? The, I think the uh, group is uh, too small to, to, to really look at it statistically. Our, we, we base most of the statistics that you've shown on labor force surveys and income surveys in Israel that are relatively small compared to what you have, for example, in the U.S. So splitting it, splitting it by those who reside in the West Bank and, and others is going to be quite challenging from a statistical point of view. So, so we haven't looked at that. Ten percent is small. Yes, Vera. Since I made that statement uh, initially, so let me respond. I, I, do not, I, I did not say that capital income inequality is, is not important. I said I know little about it. When, and, and everything you said is correct. I mean, we have high concentration of assets of, of firm ownership uh, within very few hands uh, in Israel, and that's what uh, Yossi mentioned as the 1% uh, or uh, one-tenth of a percent uh, problem. What I try to show is that even if you take that out, Israel is, is, is very highly uh, uh, unequal. So, uh, so I think the solutions uh, have to go from both directions. I mean, you have to work on the labor market inequality, and you also have to take care of, of capital uh, market inequality. Um, your, your comment about the difference between uh, Ashkenazim and Sephardim is, is uh, I think it's uh, many recent uh, studies have shown that uh, this is no longer the case. You don't see much of, uh, I, have a, I have a former student who did some work trying to see what, what uh, explains uh, income inequality and, and this origin issue becomes, it's not one of the main issues. Uh, it's definitely far, far behind uh, education. Uh, especially if you think about the fact that today most, uh, or I don't know if most, but many Israeli families, like my own, is kind of mixed. And, uh, and if you ask my girls uh, what their origin is, uh, they have a very difficult uh, time to, to, to say the answer. Actually, with respect to this issue, I, is, this, is this on? Okay. With respect to this issue, this last issue, I beg to differ. Um, it's true that ethnicity is 
not a primary or a main variable in the equation, but it's interesting to note that uh, 60 years on, uh, it is still a variable in the equation. On the one hand, it's true that 30 to 40 percent of marriages now are mixed, and that's the mine as well. Uh, so that's uh, the good part of the story. But the saddest, the sad part of the story is that inequalities between those who are ethnically unmixed, I don't want to use the word pure, are uh, on the rise intergenerationally. We are in a position to be able to measure ethnicity over three generations using these data that we are using here. And you can see that that's the case. There, are, there is a very nice, sad, but nice study by Yona Rubinstein, who is an, a former Israeli economist now working in Brandeis, who did the following thing. He compared mi ethnically mixed uh, individuals of two groups. One group is the father was Mizrahi and the mother was Ashkenazia, and the other group is the, was the other way around. Now, what is the difference between these two groups? The difference is in the family name. So when these individuals whose father was Ashkenazi and bore presumably uh, an Ashkenazi name went into the labor market, they had a, an easier time of it than those who bore a Malul or other non, distinctly non-Ashkenazi name. And the income differences, adjusting for education and whatnot, between these two groups are striking. So um, it's true these differences between the ethnic groups are largely, largely have to do with education, and some of them have to do with core periphery, but they still persist notwithstanding, and uh, they should not be uh, ignored, it, seem, it seems to me. I think, let me, let me add just one more sentence. I think what, what Yossi's comments are, are leading to is to say that we have to break somehow the intergenerational linkage of poverty, and it's not necessarily related to being Ashkenazi or Sephardi. I mean, statistically, it does, but, but this is the problem. It's not the origin, it's whether what you do in life really uh, connected uh, as strongly as it should be to what your parents uh, could offer you. Michal. That's not what I said. Cla clarif clarification before you continue. Education expanded dramatically. It is just because of that that those who are left behind with, with less education are losing out. So that, that's what I said. Thank you. 
Anyone like to pick up that gauntlet? Uh, maybe after Yossi. Mm -hmm. Yossi. Well, I'm not sure I... I'll say this. I'll say what I always say. Education should not be expected to clean up after capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not... Uh, economists tend to believe that if you just equalize education, you'll, equal, you'll go a long way towards equalizing all sorts of other things, especially earnings. Uh, as you imply by what you say, that's not the case because other things kick in. Other distinctions kick in. Uh, though the haves have ways of distinguishing themselves from the rest. And, uh, and I think we're agreed on this point. So. Um, Education can help, obviously, if it's accompanied by demand-generating programs which generate demand for, for educated labor. But then we are talking about labor market policies first and foremost. Uh, so um, I'm, education does raise expectations, and it does bring people out into the streets. I think that's the message I was trying to convey. Um, it tends to differentiate itself. You know that in the U.S. today, most income inequality is within the educated class because most people are in the educated class, except the distinctions between being at the bottom of the educated class with a two-year college degree and being a stern graduate, that's most, of in, most that's most of the inequality that you see in America. So I, yeah. Um, I fully agree with what you are implying. Evan. Yeah, I'll add briefly. There is research, two strands of research in the U.S. about, with U.S. data on what you said. One is led by Emmanuel Saez from Berkeley uh, about this inequality at the top and the 0.1% the and so on. And there is another strand led by people like David Autour from MIT, Larry Katz from Harvard, and others, about what they call the polarization of the American labor market, where, thing, where there's demand for, for jobs at the, at the top and at the bottom, and there is less demand in the middle. That perhaps relates to Yossi's point right now. So they have doc documented research, a lot of these issues in the U.S. economy, as f these phenomena can well be happening in Israel as well. As far as I'm aware, there hasn't been enough research on these points, which I think are the points you're making, serious research in Israel. Uh, I know this, by the way, because a graduate student of mine 
come, came to me a week ago with these, these research pieces, and he wasn't able to find very detailed research in that direction on Israeli data. So this is something that needs to be researched. Um, we have many questions. I have half a dozen of my own, which I am going to repress. Uh, we have a timetable to stick to, and we have all afternoon to talk. There are three more papers, including a paper by uh, Dr. Correa, that, uh, who just asked the last provocative question, uh, which is going to be very interesting, and a concluding overview. So at this point, I would say that I am reminded, hearing how bad the situation is, I'm reminded very strongly of the essayist Ephraim Kishon, who gave an account of the history of the city of Tel Aviv when he said that when the uh, first uh, few families got together a hundred years ago to build Tel Aviv, uh, the conditions were shocking and the heat was terrible and there was insufficient water. So nobody was surprised that by the end of the year there were only 5,000 people left and that the next year uh, the conditions got even worse. There were outbreaks, uh, epidemic outbreaks, and there were attacks of mosquitoes, and the neighboring Arabs from Jaffa were hostile. So who could be surprised that that 5,000 had dwindled to 25,000? <laughs> and that reminds me very much of an Israeli economy that is doing so well while, th while things are so bad. We will continue this discussion after lunch. I would ask you all to be here a few minutes before 2 o'clock so we can have a prompt uh, resumption of our talk. Thank you.